Welcome to the Lemonade Stand Stories Podcast. Tune in every Thursday as we share inspirational stories from the world's greatest creators, entrepreneurs, and go-getters about how they've turned life's lemons into lemonade. And now, here's your host of Lemonade Stand Stories, Sharon Prabaka. What is going on, guys? This is Sharon Prabaka with the Lemonade Stand Stories Podcast, and today... And I always say this all the time, it's a very special day, but today really is a special day because we're going to be talking about something very unique. We're going to be talking about curses. And you're like, Sharon, why would we talk about curses on the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast? But we need to talk about a very important curse that was broken. And the man across from me is the one that helped break this curse. This curse was over a hundred years old, right? Am I right? Yeah. It was about a hundred years old. Yeah. Ben Zobris sits across from me and he helped the Chicago Cubs take the World Series in uh, baseball, MLB baseball. And uh, he, I, I don't even know how to explain what you did, <laughs> but you hit the ball in you know, such a manner that nobody could get it. And like, all I know is like, <laughs> there were a lot of people screaming and yelling. I haven't seen a single baseball game to, say, to tell you the truth, but I know <laughs> that Ben is very involved in baseball. But dude, thanks so much, man. Thanks so much for being here, for uh, jamming out with me. Now, I do want to uh, say something, because you were the MVP, correct? Of, of, of that series. Of that yeah. series, mm -hmm. of that season, 2016. And you were also known as like a utility player. That's right. Correct? That's right. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but- You're wrong. No, I, dang, I already knew, <laughs> I knew it, dang it, no. But correct me, I'm just kidding, no. Uh, wouldn't you say in like all kinds of games and series, there could, there could be an MVP, right? Like, an, like just to help, you know, like shepherd in the team or, or whatever. For right? sure, for sure. That, yeah. that, I mean, that could, you know, be part of any kind of game that you play. Any they they don't game. name that in, in every game. They no. name it in every season usually, and then they'll name it like in a special game like the All-Star Game. Right. They'll name it in, in a special series like the National League Championship Series or the, yeah. the World Series that we were playing in. So um, yeah. it was just that series that, you know, I get to write MVP on baseballs when I sign it. Yeah. But it was just that series. that I, I wasn't like yeah. an actual season MVP. I wasn't that good. Well, listen, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm just saying this because wouldn't you consider me to be the MVP of our tennis match that we played? Because... <laughs> This is kind of how Ben and I met, you guys. <laughs> this is how we met. Um, our, we have a mutual friend, Dave Austin, who invited me to come play tennis. And he's told me weeks out in advance, yeah, our, our buddy Ben Zobrist is coming. I'll be honest, when he was describing you at first to me, I thought you were like some old guy. You know, I thought like the way Dave was explaining it, I'm like, he played baseball way back when, and I'm like, all right, okay. So I'm like, I'm like, oh man, and Dave's like 70 years old. So I'm like, I'm gonna be playing tennis with like a bunch of 70 year olds. This is gonna be great. And then he's like, yeah, Ben Zobra, you should Google him. And I did, and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy looks like he's my age. I'm like, oh no, like, and then I threw my back out that exact day. <laughs> yeah, who was the old guy then? And then I realized I was the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. But didn't I, but, but you know, that was a fun day, you know? It was a fun day, and, you know? and Dave, Dave always seems to put me together with people. Yeah. And, you know, he's like my friend, you know, in Utah out here that has introduced me to everyone, including you. Yes. Which is why we're even sitting here together because yes. of Dave Austin. So I love Dave. And, but yeah, that tennis match did, you know, the, the good thing about it was like, I, there was enough of a connection with you. I'm like, dude, I want to hang out with this guy. He's yes, awesome. <laughs> but like, yeah, I was, I kind of felt bad, you know, trying to serve and spike, you know, like really Dude, you destroyed Nail me. You. <laughs> you, you destroyed me. It was it was amazing. I, I I threw my back out that day, and I still played, and it was the worst because I actually played tennis, but not that day. Um, but then we had another funny experience, also with Dave Austin, where we were invited to like this event, mm -hmm. and we both showed up not knowing that we were actually going to be speakers at this event. <laughs> right. and we're like, wait, what? I'm speaking at this uh, thing? I was and like, so, what are you supposed to say? Yeah, and you're like, like, I don't know. I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say either. And that's how, and that's how in, in, the, in the throes of Dave Austin's craziness, we forged a friendship, which I'm actually yeah, quite, fantastic. quite excited and about. And at that specific event, there was a yes. guy there that like helped, you know, uh, found, what was it? The Apple yes, stuff. like yeah, he it found was crazy. That was so wild, and and as those people were going, and as like you were going with like 
all of your stats with baseball, I kept thinking to myself, dude, I have got nothing. I hope he doesn't call me. And then he calls me. I'm like, shoot. Okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to go with the comedy angle and see what happens. Because nobody was really like bringing any humor, I felt, in no, that thing. No, right? you, it was kind of a you, serious thing. Yeah, you were definitely funny. And, yeah, yeah, um, funny. and then I walked out and didn't want to listen to the rest of it because I was bored. No, I'm kidding. No, dude. It was, <laughs> it was a good night. It was I actually fun, got right? pulled after because I was right before you. You were remember? Before me, And yeah. then I got pulled over by a guy. Who was talking to me talking to me about what he does it was that was an incredible event it was a cool event there was, was a lot of people there that are kind of doing a lot of fun things so it was fun to be able to listen like, to some of the stories and yeah. uh, of other things that have happened which dave is great at. he's great at pulling that kind of stuff out too uh, he is it's awesome and, and you know it's it's been cool because like as i've had a chance to like hang out with you then and like hang out with you on the slopes um it's been cool because i feel like our conversations have gone way past like what we do professionally like you know you played baseball professionally i'm an actor professionally but what we talked about was more um like spiritual stuff and deep stuff and and talking about how to improve the mind of a person and the soul of a person so i really want to dive into some of that stuff but um i do want to give like a little bit of a history if you don't mind like talk about how you even got into baseball like what was like the the motivation to get you to play in the with for the cubs i guess yeah well i mean m my story obviously I, I grew up in a small town in illinois and yeah my dad was a former military guy and um you know he was a pastor of a church in this small town and and he loved sports and his dad loved sports and stuff so he just from an early age he taught me mental toughness while i played sports and he mm. was just like this is this is how you got to play the game. And, and so I, I learned fundamentally the ways to play the game of baseball. And I was a good athlete in a lot of other sports too um, in my small town. And just, just I just dove in head first. Like I loved yeah. the game. And uh, uh, as I got older, finished high school with no scholarships, but eventually um, at a scout day, which, which is really neat that I, I had no, no scholarships at all coming out of graduating high school. And my mm. high school coach says, hey, you know, you were you were a good area player. I wasn't even an all-state player, which a lot of kids become. Uh, I wasn't even that good. And, and I was a little smaller still. I hadn't really grown into my body yet. Yeah. And my coach said- I still hey. haven't. <laughs> you're you're still waiting for that? I'm still waiting, but don't worry. I'm following your footsteps. <laughs> okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he in, says, hey, you should go to this scout day and see what happens. And I go and I meet this- coach um, who sees something in me and he just said hey yeah. I think you'd be great for our program and I think I think with your academics we could get you a scholarship so there you go kids I mean pay attention to that right because yeah. like academics. if I hadn't had decent academics he might have been like yeah maybe we can't help this kid yeah out. there's no way he can throw a ball he got a D in biology you know, <laughs> right. you know? no no I, I I was I was thankfully a decent student and so yeah. I got a scholarship to go there long story short Tran end up transferring to uh, um, Dallas Baptist University in Texas and um, get drafted into into professional baseball. So let me ask you: When you were growing up and everything, and you know you you fell into like the love of the sport, did you have this idea in your mind like I want to do this professionally? No, I I did not. You, you know, did I know not. I, I, okay. a lot of kids I see nowadays like they're already thinking that way. Like, how do I go from here to there? Yeah, I never thought that way. I always thought like like the biggest thing I could think of in my mind was to potentially win a state championship with my okay. high school. Like I, I was the, the Eureka Hornets, that was our name, you know, and mascot, it was it. like, it's like I just wanted to win a state championship and if I could have helped my, and which I never got to do, mm. but that was, that was like my dream. And then when that dream was over, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to college and I don't know what I'm necessarily gonna do. Yeah. But um, it wasn't, it, even when I got drafted professionally, I, I never got too far ahead. So so that was one of the things that I, I do try to tell, especially young people, not to focus on that end goal, like mm. focus on how do you get better today and how do you um, essentially learn from the lessons that you're learning today. You know, I like that concept because it's kind of like shine where you stand. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Where you're not overly concerned about like, okay, this is gonna happen, so this is gonna happen, and you kind of create this like roadmap, because I almost feel like, you know, you know, we both talk about this, but we both have like this like deep belief in God, and sometimes I, I think like, if we try to create the plan ourselves, we're like, well, uh, he's like, I can't, what can I do, you know? Like, yeah. well, you got a finite plan, right? Yeah. But it's almost like, if you can kind of get out of your own way and be like, hey, this is the platform that God's put me on, like, let's figure out a way to shine here. Right. Then like more cool things can happen, right? Right, I mean, so, I'm all for setting smart goals if that's what right. your thing is, but like, 
for me, that wasn't, I didn't write my goals down. Like in my mind, it's like, oh, I, I want to be good. Yeah. Uh, and I thought like maybe there's a number if you're putting stats up or something that, that help you feel like you're, you're doing better than others. But for me, it was like, how do I just get better, one step better than I was yesterday? Yeah. I wanted to just do more, do more, do more. How can I get better, better, better? And so the big thing for me that worked for me is I loved the tinkering. I loved the, the alone time in the batting cage, yeah. working on my craft, honing my craft. And, and the performing was just a, a byproduct of that. Mm. But I was working so hard by myself in, in, in this deep practice, yeah. you know, working on the details and like, how do, how do I do this a little bit better than I did before? And, and I think that was one of the things to be able to focus for a very long time in, the, in that just like, and I've talked to Dave about that before. I think I might have even mentioned that at that event we were talking about. But, yeah. but focus was one of my superpowers as an athlete, whereas I wasn't the most physically gifted guy um, or, or skill wise, wasn't the most skilled, but I did feel like I could focus. And that helped yeah. me kind of block out some of the, the big crowd stuff as I got later in my career and was, was trying to win championships. I was able to focus on the ball and focus on some of the minutia of the details that, that helped me be successful. You know, I really like that because it talks about like, you know, there's the whole idea of like getting in that state of flow, being in that zone, mm -hmm. right? Where everything else disappears. <clears throat> you mentioned something that I think is uh, very interesting, which is you love the tinkering aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Like you love being in the battling cages when nobody else was around. It wasn't about the glory of other people praising you and things like that. I had this conversation with someone who was telling me that they were getting into acting, but then they pretty soon after quit. And I asked him, well, so why did you guys quit? And or why did you quit? And he said to me, he's like, dude, I was in it for the wrong reasons. I wanted to get famous. Mm. I didn't really care about acting. I didn't care about the craft of it. Mm -hmm. And yet here I am thinking, man, like I, that's the part I love. You know, I love like the actual acting part of it. Like mm -hmm. the, the part of like the fame and stuff, I'm, that's like whatever. But the actual craft, getting in there, playing, experimenting, and trying new things and trying new ways to focus is, is awesome. But what I want to ask you is like, you know, when you're in the batting cages or, or things like that, or when you, the crowd starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and there's more noise, and of course, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. How do you stay so present and centered and focused on that ball coming towards you? Yeah, that is one of the toughest things when you have all these distractions and you have things, the yeah. ups and downs. And I think, you know, just self-regulation in a moment like that uh, yeah. is becomes much more difficult when you have a lot going on around you or if it's new, you know, especially yeah. when there's a new situation you're not used to. Now, I, at, at certain points in my career, later in my career, when I was in championship situations, some of those I had been in before. Like the first time you, you get in a situation like that, it's harder to block out some of the things because you don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But as time went on and I played in front of many crowds and I played games that where the season was on the line and I, with the Chicago Cubs one, that was different because of that 108 year curse. Yeah. You know, it was a game seven. It was the last game of the year possible. I mean, it was, was one of those. There was a lot of things riding on There was that a thing. lot of things riding on right. that moment. And that was a little different, but I also knew what worked in those similar situations before. Mm -hmm. So for me, what, what, what worked or what didn't necessarily always work, but gave me the best chance for it mm -hmm. to work, was to focus on the finite focus of what is that guy on the mound trying to do? What is gonna be the challenge here in this situation mm -hmm. that I know is coming at me? And how do I not get so mechanical about reacting to it, but but just um, stay in a state of, of um, adjustment yeah you know it where, where i'm going to use all my skills i know what i have i know what he has mm -hmm. i don't know what he's going to do but i also trust and know that I, I i have the ability to make an adjustment it may not be the perfect one or the right one right but if it's good enough it's going to give me a good chance and my team a good chance to make something good happen and and as a matter of fact that that moment in the world series game seven that i got this big hit that really kind of gave me that mm -hmm. that accolade and helped us win was really one of those moments that, like, I didn't even hit the ball that well. It, you know, it's it, it kind of slapped it down the line. I hit it off the barrel, but it wasn't. There was nothing really super amazing about it, mm -hmm. except for the fact that it was the moment that really counted. If there was yeah. one moment in my career I would have wanted to succeed, it, it would have been that, that one. Moment. Yeah, of the thousands and thousands of times I had chances. So. Mm -hmm. And it could have easily gone the other way. Nobody'd be talking about it. Yeah, I would have been 
maybe the Cleveland Indians win. Yeah. Somebody else is the, the MVP that everybody remembers, you know, but it, for whatever reason, and this goes into that idea of God and faith, and there's, there's something else going on here. Mm-hmm. For some reason, that was something God wanted me to experience yeah. at that point in my life and get all this accolade and fame and all this. And, and pretty soon after, it had a profound effect in a negative way, too, yeah, which we talked want, a little and bit I want, And I want to talk about that. Yeah. I want to talk about that for sure. Because um, you had to kind of experience that moment, right? You had to experience that moment of that incredible high to realize that that's not who you are. That's right. Right? And that's a powerful realization because, you know, we, we were talking about on the lift earlier today about like, hey, there are some people that are constantly chasing things down, right? Mm-hmm. Because of this need to be fulfilled or something. And of course, every, every person wants to be valued mm-hmm. and, and seen and everything like that. But if you're constantly like needing this to get fulfilled and that to get fulfilled, it's like a, it's like a, like a hit of, I don't know, like, I don't want to say drug, but you know what I mean? It's just like that, this hit of like uh, dopamine, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're getting like this incredible high and then guess what? It goes away. It goes away real soon. And you're like, crud, what's my next thing? Right. And I remember um, in LA, I had, I'd got to LA and, um, I finally got this break on Silicon Valley, which was this huge dopamine hit, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, HBO show. And like, it's going to be seen by a ton of people. And I had like a really nice premiere part. They even showed like trailers of me on HBO when that was happening. And it was this moment where I was like, oh my gosh, all these years of like, kind of like doing these things has kind of paid off. And now I'm going to get this whole thing. But then it went away Mm -hmm. just as quickly as it came, Mm -hmm. right? But then there was this one day I remember where I was walking to my car for a new audition and I remember feeling this incredible sense of happiness. So much so that I'm like, whoa, I don't need this audition to go any particular way for me to be happy. Like I am so fulfilled and happy right now. And, and I know we were kind of like talking about that with your career because you were kind of chasing after oh, yeah. things, right? Oh, so yeah. let's talk a little bit about that for yeah. a second. Yeah, well, I mean, really what you're describing is that sense of being. Like you knew who you were in that moment and not yeah. just about what, I mean, what you were doing is just a byproduct of who you were as opposed to like trying to prove something to yourself yeah. by going and performing and getting that role or crushing the audition or something like that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we all have to step into various roles at different times in our lives. Completely. And, and I was in the role of, you know, playing left field for the Chicago Cubs that night. You know, that was the role I had. I'd, I had a role on that team. I was a veteran. Um, I had a role, you know, just, you know, I just had, you have roles in your life in, in lots of different ways. And, but I think when it comes down to it, if I can't, find a way to know who I am outside of all those roles, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to always be chasing down some sort of performance in the role in order to prove something to myself or to somebody else. Yeah. And I think... Were you doing that for a bit? I was definitely doing that. I was definitely doing that for a lot of my career. And part of it was there was always a carrot to go after. You know, when you're a minor league player, it's like, oh, if I could just make it to the next level, mm-hmm. right? So then you get moved up. Your team sees that you're playing well enough, they'll move you up to double A, and then they move you up to triple A. And then finally, well, if I could just get to the major leagues, I would I will have made it, right? Yeah. So you, then you go and you go, you finally get the call up to the major leagues. And it's this amazing moment. It's like a dream come true. You run out on a field and you, it's like, that's the dream that, that yeah. every young baseball player would love to have, which I didn't really care about as a kid, mm-hmm. but now I'm living it, right? Right. But then... You get there and it's just not enough. You know, why? Because you've How did gotta, you know it wasn't enough? Because there's always the next. I, I didn't know it was not enough until later in my career, but mm-hmm. but because as soon as I got there, there was another goal to hit. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I mean, anybody in business understands that like as soon as you reach one plateau, that's not enough. You got to get to the next one, right? Mm-hmm. So, so ultimately, make it into the major leagues then you're like oh i gotta stay here how do i how do i solidify myself as a as a player here on this team where i stay here and they don't send me back down because they can always send you back down completely and so then you get you get that role where you're like okay i'm gonna starter i'm gonna i'm gonna be a starter on this team and then it's like well if i could just earn a contract you know a contract that's guaranteed where i've got guaranteed yeah. money coming in and then finally i've got that money in the bank and then after that that's great and all but if you rest in those laurels then 
you know, one contract, is that going to be enough? Because like, usually your first contract is smaller yep. and then your next one's a little bit bigger. So you got to go for the next contract and the next. Yeah. And then once I got the contracts and financially, I felt like where I, you, you still want to win, you're a competitor sure. and you want to be known and build a legacy as a baseball player. So you want to win championships, right? So I got traded to a team, the Kansas City Royals that won a championship in 2015. Hmm. And we had an amazing run with that team. and. And so I won a championship. So then I became a free agent and got the big payday, which was fantastic. But then who are you, who, what's the next, the next big thing I can do? The Chicago Cubs haven't won for 108 years. Yeah. Why not go for that one? So yeah. I sign up with that team, right? And I have a four year contract, but what happens? We win in the first, the first year. year I Amazing. was there. Yeah. So I got three more years to figure that out. So when we won, I had this incredible moment of satisfaction. And I, I mean, I, dude, I went to Jimmy Fallon, yeah. Conan O'Brien, uh, you know, Disney World on a private jet. You had like a connection with Will Ferrell somewhere, right? Dude, well, that was earlier, yeah. Was Will, Will, Will Ferrell actually yeah. showed up and did uh, one of his documentaries. I think it's, what's it called? It's uh, Ferrell Takes the Field. In okay. spring training, he did it. Okay. And he was with our team for a, a few minutes. And I, I think I'm like, there's like a little moment blip. I'm in that documentary yes. talking to him or whatever. But anyways, um, I, I got to do all these incredible things. And then guess what? I come home and I'm in the carpool line at 6 a.m. taking my kids to school. And I'm like, this is actual real life. Like that was just this fantasy ride I was on. Great, fantastic, so much yeah. fun. But now this is real life, and I'm going. What's my next carrot? And I don't know what it is. Yeah, because you for got the first the MVP, time in my life, you got all that stuff, and you don't know your carrot. I don't know what I'm pursuing next. What's the next goal? And so when all the goals and carrots and all those things were done, that is when I had this realization of, oh crap! Like I'm in trouble. Like yeah. I've got to figure out how to really be satisfied because I got three more years of this game to play, and I found myself like losing sleep. And I started kind of spiraling a little bit, like in my thought life, like who am I? Like if I'm if I if I'm not pursuing this anymore, yeah. what it, what am I really all about? And I knew I was a, you know, I, I knew what kind of person I was deep down, but I think I just had this crisis moment because things were really uh, unstable. Because all of a sudden I was like, well, now what? Yeah, your instability came not because of failure, but because of success. Right. Which I think is very interesting. And I didn't know this, but I, I started going to therapy then, which was, I'm glad I did. I still do it, you know, regularly. Yeah, awesome. And I think everybody should. I, I just think whether you're feeling, you know, unwell or not, I still think it's a very healthy Absolutely. thing to do. And, and I would support anybody doing that. But I, I learned some things during that time that it was a little bit of a PTSD of sorts for me socially mm -hmm. to, to go through that because... I don't love giant crowds. And, and I mean, listen, there were 7 million people at the Cubs parade in Chicago. That's insane. And we're, I, it was like being the Beatles at the time. It was no. crazy. And I think, I think with all that craziness, um, my system was overloaded, completely overwhelmed and overloaded. And the therapist explained to me like, no, like the reason why you don't feel good right now is because you actually are, are more of the person that enjoys being by yourself in the cage tinkering than you are like doing the performance in front of 50,000 people. Dude, it's interesting you were saying this because like you, you look at like social media and everything like that and you look at kids that are like looking after like how many likes did I get? How many followers do I have? How many this, how many that, you know? And yet we're not meant to have the praise of this entire world like you know in fact i think like sometimes the praise of this entire world is so insanely overwhelming that you're like dude i just want to go be by myself and it's cool because and it's cool that your therapist made that connection for you right that like by yourself tinkering exploring like that was where the joy always was yeah in the game right? of baseball in the game of baseball and then you move away from it and and you and I was cool, like just having a normal life, you yeah. know, like going back to Tennessee where I lived and just being in part of a normal community and whatnot. I didn't need all the fame. I didn't actually want it. You know, that was crazy. It was it was more than I wanted yeah. at the time. And I think some people are more made for like they love crowds and they play to crowds well and and it gives them energy and it really, um, you know, I, I can do, I like to speak in front of people. 
but I can only do that for a few hours. And then mm -hmm. I like to go be alone yeah. or go be with like my people, you, you know? You like to charge by yourself. Yes, I, I'm more too. of an introvert when it comes to charge, but yeah. I'm an outward processor. Like I, mm -hmm. I will talk a lot, you know, at times if we're having a conversation. But I think that we, what I was learning at the time is that um, I had always been trying to be enough as a person yeah. through the performances. And I always felt like because it's happening and I'm reaching them, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there was nothing else to reach for, right? Uh, so that that was actually my, you know, making lemons moment, right? Yeah. Of, of, of I've got to figure out now what is going to give me the same motivation that I had before? Because I was a very motivated person. And it's scary to be a very motivated person and get to a crossroads where you're like, I'm not motivated by anything. Yeah. It's a very scary place to be. It is. I mean, yeah. it took me into, into a depressive episode yeah. for about three months um, that I eventually came out of, but it was scary, be, yeah. you know, feeling that way and trying to understand what happened yeah. and, and, and how to recapture that when I couldn't force myself to do it. Now that, and, and now I'm a strong person. There's a lot of strong people out there and you're taught from a young age how to be strong. And so you've, yeah. you've kind of attacked a lot of things in your life, you know, that you've went and got through strength, right? Mm -hmm. And, or through mind, like I, I'm a very mind oriented person. I, I love to think and strategize and find new ways to, to um, do accomplish things, things. Yeah. throw things up against the wall and see what's the best option, right? Mm -hmm. I, I love doing that. Um, but I needed to tap into some other parts of me, some other parts of, um, some other strategies to, to kind of get healthy from where I was at, yeah. but also try to figure out what is my new pursuit. And it's interesting because in this place, you're now going to venture into territories where you're going to experience life itself differently. Right. Like an entire paradigm shift, yes. right? A shift from your mind, a shift from um, like your strength, mm -hmm. right? To something completely different. Right. And before you before that option was even available or before you realized it was available you were freaking out because you're like oh no 100 percent. now what right yeah. so talk to me about this shift like i want to know like how you went from mind and strength to wherever you went to so li liminal space have you heard of this right mm -hmm. yeah. it's just just the idea of like it's the space that where things change mm -hmm. and and move and I, I, I kind of was thrust into that through like success right a lot mm -hmm. of people are thrust into that through failure if they're pursuing something, um, or they're 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 doing one thing for a long time, and yeah. a tragedy strikes, and then they have to shift gears and try to find a new way. Um, so, I was in that before I was finished with my career. I knew I still had to play baseball. I mean, I signed a yeah. contract, and I wasn't going to dip out on that. But I still didn't know how I was really going to love doing it again, mm -hmm. right? And I remember thinking, like, waking up this one morning. And I had done a lot of prayer because faith is a really important part yeah, of my life. And I was praying and asking God, like, "How? why do I feel this way? Help me change that. Like, and, I, and I was like, I felt, I woke up one morning and it was like this word enough, enough, enough on my head. And I was like, why? You know, like I had never really even before that or since then had had like a word kind of like imprinted on my forehead or mm -hmm. in my, I didn't have a vision or hear a voice. But it was like, it was there. And was I was there, like, you knew it. Yeah, why is that there? And then I was like, okay. And I started praying again. I'm like, you're right, enough of this. I, I gotta stop this whining and mm -hmm. this blah, 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 and just move forward. Yeah. And it was like, God stopped me in the moment. It was like, nope. That's not no, what I mean. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. And I felt this, this gentle um, thought like come into me that was, you're enough when you're not performing at all. You're enough when you're in your worst place right now where you feel broken and you feel like you can't help yourself. Yeah. Like, I just want you to know that you're enough then. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and as a Christian, he was saying, you were enough then for me to send my son to die on the cross for you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know I loved you that much. So all this stuff that you're putting on yourself, the weight that you feel, the pressure that you feel, um, the failure that you feel in the success and all those things. Like, I just didn't feel like I was ever enough. Um, yeah. I felt that for the first time really in that moment. And, and, and I've never not felt it since then. It was like, that was like this moment that I started learning how to set healthy boundaries and say no, you know, so that I could like not feel pressured by other people, like started literally paying attention to 
um, God's love for me when I was broken, when I hurt, when I messed up or whatever. And mm. playing a professional sport, you mess up a lot. You you fail a lot. Mm. So it was like the last few years. I mean, I was still a perfectionist in my craft. I still was was competing, but I, I was not beating myself up anymore. Yeah. I was actually starting to see the beauty in even the failure at times mm. and how that that builds growth. So I started to grow. Like one of the things I was talking to a, a uh, actually sports psychologist at the time yeah. during this period of time, we talked about is the difference between fixed mindset and growth mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, Carol Dweck, I think uh, George Leonard wrote a book called Mastery that mm -hmm. I read during this time. Um, just this this idea that like, you know, when you're when you're broke or when things are not going well is actually when you have the best opportunity to change and grow and become more of who you are meant to be. I love that. You know, and and, and if you don't listen in those moments and you just are just upset about it, yeah, then you're missing out on an opportunity to really break through. It that moment when you felt like you were enough. Yeah, things had changed dramatically, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that you when you lose, you're losing something. So I started grieving my career at that point. I started like okay, what, what is actually happening? Like I, I, I'm wanting, I'm basically retiring before I'm ready to, before I'm physically retiring, I'm emotionally retiring yeah. in a way. And I think sometimes what, what we don't realize is those moments end up being more paradigm shifting than anything physically or outwardly. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes outwardly things happen and that cause the emotional turmoil inwardly, but it's really, far more about what's happening inside a person than Absolutely. what's happening outside, right? So when I started to look in more, and I'm not talking about navel gazing and not being aware of anything else around you or whatnot, I'm talking about actual self-awareness. I started doing self-awareness work. I started digging into emotional stuff more, um, talking to ther my therapist about a lot of things, you know, more than just the fact that I was struggling sleeping, you know, you know, even after I got healthy, like I said, I continued to, yeah. to talk about things and what, what is it that I needed to process that I hadn't processed. And, um, you know, those moments are really the moments that I think you, you, uh, you shift into being the person that you, you know, you're, 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 you're becoming, right? Less mm -hmm. than being like, you're becoming something, you mm -hmm. know, becoming someone. And for me, I mean, I didn't lose the values and the boundaries that I had before. Um, some of them got stronger and some of them got, you know, like went away, you know, but at the same time, I, um, I was able to, 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 feel you say, you say at peace i was able to feel okay not being okay so i maybe mm -hmm. wasn't at peace inside but i was i was like hey if this doesn't change right away that's okay mm. you know if my feelings don't change at least i know what they are yeah at least i i'm i'm aware of what's going on and that's i think the scariest thing before is to not to not be aware and i think like i had and i'll i'll be honest with this and i think this will help some people that are going through it at times I had suicidal ideation at the time. Now, I didn't say anything to anybody at the time. I've yeah. since talked about it a little bit, but that can be so scary. But that's what what I didn't understand is that's the brain's way of trying to protect itself. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to come up with new ways to try to get out of this because you're so miserable yeah. internally. If you're not sleeping, if you've got physical things, but you also got emotional things going on. And for me to separate who I was from those thoughts and go, oh, that's not me. That's just like, that's me telling, that's my brain telling me I'm not feeling good. I'm I'm sick, I'm unwell, right? Because that's not me, you know? Yeah. So I can separate from that and go, oh, if that happens, at least now I know that that's happening because I'm kind of sick and I need to do some processing of things. I'm emotionally in turmoil. I need to physically do some things to care for myself. Yes. I had to do a lot of proper self-care to get back to where I was like, back in that healthy mindset before spring training of, now I gotta go play a baseball game and be a healthy individual and then deal with all the social stuff that go, go on with it and everything. So yeah. I think those moments bring such profound sense of groundedness yeah. when you can start to go, oh, there's, I am not just simply 
one type like I, i'm not just in the strength realm here it's not like 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 there's a social part of this there's a mental part of it there's mm -hmm. a physical part of it there's there's all different parts of ourselves that sometimes you have to care for yourself in ways yeah. that you didn't know how to before yeah right and that that really helped me kind of set the set the stage for how do i get healthy the next yeah. season of life as i'm transitioning out of baseball into whatever's next into whatever's next because i had no idea what the future was going to look like yeah now, we talked about this a little bit before but you said one of your passions now is to help other people like especially like athletes or, or young men with like their own emotional intelligence which it sounds like the exact path that you went on and you had to discover for yourself and now you're like okay yeah. i've learned these things yeah. so what does that look like well men and athletes in general in the american culture now not every culture but i think yeah. primarily here you're taught to take your emotions and kind of shove them down early on because mm -hmm. emotions especially when you're young they don't really help you in in sports very often i mean there are sometimes it can help you but especially not in a skill sport like baseball uh, your skills get messier and not as precise when you get overly emotional and yeah. then you make bad decisions you know on the field you're you're just not doing things as well. So you learn early on how to shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned how to be under control of my body and my mind while I played and just shut down any sort of emotional parts of me. And also, I didn't really understand the soul. I didn't understand personality and, and quirks and distinctness and uniqueness that every person has that brings to the table, regardless of what their physical appearance or physical skills or mm -hmm. anything that they have grown into yeah. Um, in it as an athlete, that that like what I knew is the sole part of me as a baseball player that made me different from any other player was my unique combination of skill, how I learned, what I enjoyed, what I hated, mm -hmm. that all these different things about my sport mm -hmm. that made me unique and my experience unique. Now I have the same experience as a lot of players. If you say, oh, we all played baseball, or we all played left field or shortstop, or I was a switch hitter or whatever, utility players. You can, you can find a common experience in there, and I can relate to somebody through that, but the way that I experienced the game of baseball was different than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, there are gonna be some similarities there, but I need to, to kind of tap into who I was as a player mm -hmm. because, and that, here's why that's important, because whatever you did in this role in baseball, if you find the things that made you really you, that will translate down the road to something else. It'll just mm -hmm. be a different role. Yeah. So the tinkering, you know, we talked about that. Like experimenting. I yeah. love to do that in other realms now. So yeah. like in emotional intelligence or talking to young athletes about how do you how do you take a identity that you have on the field and merge it with an identity you have off the field. So mm -hmm. that you're not just becoming compartmentalized so much, but you're yeah. actually like taking your full self in both places and you're transitioning well in and out of I sport. love that, dude. I love that. And out of your roles. And yeah. you understand that as an actor? I do, because the thing is, um, I remember the moment where I felt like my acting career took a huge shift was when I was told, like when I was watching an online video about what Brian Cranston had given, about bringing you to the character, like bringing who you are, like not putting yourself around, yourself away, but bringing yourself into it. And that is kind of what led me to being like, oh, I'm going to bring my life, my voice, mm -hmm. my my essence to every character I do. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that that's what people wanted, which was weird and amazing and incredible, but that's what they wanted. And because the more I did that, the more I was able to connect. You're transitioned out of baseball. You're doing other things right now. You're kind yeah. of, and we were talking about this, you're in transition still, yeah. discovering your new, your new path. Yeah. But yet, you seem as Ben way more grounded in who you are and you're not just the baseball player, you know? And, and so I want to know what that path is like right now. Yeah. Uh, gosh, that's a great question. I mean, it, it is, I think it's constantly kind of being shaped and it's a lot of it is shaped by my new experiences. I think it's shaped by um, my, uh, curiosities now more than it could be before. I mean, with with baseball, I mean, your schedule is so set and everything mm -hmm. is so um, focused on performance on the field that you have to do a lot of training. It's a lot of body work. 
and I have been able to pull back from that and giving me more freedom to like explore different parts of me mm -hmm. that I enjoy. Like I love being out in nature. I love hiking. That's part of why I love Utah is it's amazing. the mountains. I mean, the mountains call to me more than a beach necessarily uh, or the water and, and, and hiking, mountain biking, snowboarding, skiing. I mean, this type of stuff is, is a way for me to connect to myself, to, con to connect to God, to connect to other people. I mean, for me, it's just a, uh, it's, it's opened my being able to be retired and not have to have a job, which is, you know, I mean, I need some schedule. I need some, some um, boundary to my day at times, which is why I'm like, okay, now it's time. It's been like a couple of years. I'm ready to, you know, I, I mean, are you goals. hiring, Sharon? I mean, I, I, I am, dude. In fact, this is actually part of the why you're here. This is a great job interview. And uh, so far you've been doing well. I have some concerns. I'm just kidding. No. Um, you know, it's one yeah. of those things where um, yeah. I don't know exactly what it's supposed to look like, but I do know what I like. Mm. You know, I, I know what I like and I know where I feel like I fit mm -hmm. uh, as far as interactions with people. So whatever the job is, is less important to me Good. than how I'm able to interact with people while that job is happening. That makes complete sense to me. Have you ever seen the movie Field of Dreams? Uh, have I ever? Come on. Come on. I know. Come on. Come on. Come on. It was, that was a test question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Job interview is going well. Uh, it's like my favorite movie. Okay. I love the movie Field of Dreams. Mm -hmm. It's It's been so great. And one day, do you know the actor Ed Harris? Do you know who that is? Yeah. Um, I checked him in at, um, at Sundance once. He's not in the movie Field of Dreams, but his wife is Amy Madigan, who is Kevin Costner's wife in Field really? of Dreams. Okay. And when I, I met her, and I'm like, oh my gosh, step aside, Ed Harris, you yeah, know, right. <laughs> tell me all the things, you know. Annie, but she's yeah, here. She's here, you know. And so, anyway, it was so good. And the thing that I love about that movie is they're using baseball as the means for a man connecting back with his father. That's right. You know, and and I mean, you know, it's kind of his earthly father, but I almost think like in a way God has used you and used baseball as the means of connecting you back with him. Right. Right. And so I think I, and I just kept thinking those parallels are so interesting. Right. You know, as you're speaking, what, what's occurring to me is that there are certain needs that we all have. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think, I don't know who uh, came up with these three. I mean, there's variations of, of how these things make us feel fulfilled in life. But essentially, um, I was reading something that said one of the main needs is to feel fully and truly seen as a person, right? Mm. Like I am seen, and and not just seen, but known, right? Mm. To be to be truly known for who you are, you know. Um, that's one need that people have. Another need that people have is that that they're valued. They like it's not enough to just I know you as a person. Like I need, like I need someone to also tell me that I'm valuable. You know, and, mm. and for me to know, like, if I'm not there, in some way I'm missed. Mm. In some way there was a value that's been missed. Um, I bring something to the table. And a lot of people feel that through skill. But, but you know, you can, you can feel that whether or not you have a skill. It it's really comes from outside of you. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people um, don't know how to get it early on. Like, they're looking for that from their caretakers, right? Yeah. And the, the same thing, that the last thing is is belonging, right? A sense of like, do I have a group of people that I fit with, you know, where I, where I know that I fit? Like, I don't think we were ever made to be alone. Yeah. We were never made to be on an island. And all those things, we need connection. Mm -hmm. We need connection to ourselves, but we need connection to other people. Like a community. A community right? to be able to truly feel fulfilled. So like, you can go and, and crush it in a job, but if you're not really connected to your the people you work with, you're not gonna be as fulfilled in crushing it as you would if you love the people you work with. Yeah. Right? And so I think kind of what you're describing is this you've you've learned the art of understanding where you're seen and valued from God, from others, from yourself, um, where you belong. Mm -hmm. You've you've you have enough of that that you don't you don't have this real need for a job to give you a sense of belonging mm -mm. or a job to give you a sense of value or a job to give you a sense of being seen. You're already having all those things. Mm -hmm. So all that is just icing on the cake. So it's like if an opportunity presents itself here, you're out of the abundance of what you already feel a capacity of being filled up, mm -hmm. you can pour out in yes. that situation yep. that it just appears to you, right? Like your eyes, all of a sudden you can see things you couldn't see before. 
you realize when you live like this that there was a straight jacket you were in and you didn't even realize you had it on the whole time until you finally took it off. And you're like, oh my gosh. Because you feel the sense of incredible freedom, this incredible peace, this incredible freedom, this incredible light that you're like, I am free to love other people. I, I'm, I'm full. I, I feel open. I feel r- relaxed. I feel just loved in a sense, right? And, and it is interesting. One of the advice I always give people whenever they ask me, like, what's the first thing that we should do when we move to LA to be an actor? What's the first thing? I say, the first thing you should do, forget about agents, forget about acting classes, make good friends. Yeah. That is the first thing you should do. <laughs> yeah. Like, I promise you, because- And choose wisely. Choose wisely. <laughs> Especially in LA. <laughs> I know, seriously. But I'm always like, make good friends, because, and, and friends are those that are, and in fact, find friends outside of the industry. Don't even have them in the industry. Like make, make friends that you don't have to always talk about acting with. Like, in fact, you should probably not even talk, like go do fun stuff that's outside of any sort of work. 100%. You know? That's, that is one of the most important things in my life and has helped me transition better to being done with baseball because I know my people in my life, they yeah. love me for me, yeah. not because of what I'm giving them, yeah. not because of what I did. They're like, like, like some of my best friends now didn't even know me three years ago yeah. when I was playing. And so they're like, yeah, I don't, they don't care at all the fact that I did anything baseball. They actually make jokes about it. You yeah, know, like great. they're giving me a hard time about yeah. like, like if, if, yeah. if I need some sort of preference, they're like, oh, does the MVP need something? You yeah. Know, like, yeah. <laughs> like making fun of me. No, dude, I, I think it's, I think it's amazing. Like I've got, um, I got some friends of mine. I mean, some of them are in the industry, but one of the things that we love to do are like epic road trips. We will do road trips and we will go camp in like the middle of nowhere. And I mean, honestly, you know, you're talking about Utah. Like I love exploring the mountains and nature. And I know a lot of cool places just because I've lived here for a long time. So if you come out here in the summer, we can definitely do those things. But um, it's cool because those things I feel are what drives true connection. When I'm with my friends, we're out in the middle of nowhere when there's nobody, there's no cell service, there's none of that stuff. It's just you're there with your people and you're hanging out, having a good time, having a campfire. Like there's something there that is so profoundly special and it's free and it's also so deep, right? And rich. And I'm like, man, nothing, no accolades in acting I've had can top that experience, you know? Well, you don't have to tell, you're preaching to the choir, man, right. because I, I love nature and I love, like it was hard for me to be in the concrete jungle like yeah. for, for seven months out of the year. Yeah. Because I mean, all the major league baseball stadiums, are you're not gonna find any of them out in the mountains. Right. You know, they're like in the middle of big cities, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I even love, I mean, I, I, I love my city time, but I just can only do so much of it. Yeah. Whereas like, if I need to go refresh, there's no better place for me than in nature. Um, we're gonna wrap things up. Um, I want have just like a couple last questions for you. Quick fire questions. What brings you joy right now? Uh, snowboarding. It's fun, right? It's freaking <laughs> yeah, amazing. It is. Yeah, and I, I you like had like such a cheeky grin, and I had that same grin because I mean <laughs> I love snowboarding so much, and I know we've gone a couple times. What's your greatest fear right now? Ooh, uh, greatest fear: um, water damage in my basement. <laughs> That's a terrible fear. Do you have personal experience with that? I, I actually do, unfortunately. Yeah. I know, dude. Like you just barely had, like went through all that craziness. The last question I was going to ask um, as we wrap up, let's say we have a time machine, okay? And this Ben Zobrist is now has the opportunity to go back in time and communicate with the Ben Zobrist that was chasing the carrots, that was chasing after all of those things. Ooh. What advice would you give him? Wow. slow down, slow down and, mm. and, um, slow down and, and feel it mm. instead of just rushing through it. Yeah. I was in such a rush to go yeah. get it. We don't understand that life is not just about getting from A to B, but all the in-between moments, right? Oh, oh it's way more about the journey and the process yes. than the destination. Yes, absolutely. Um, I love that, man. I love that. And I think that's a beautiful message. And it's, it's great because, you know, I've had all kinds of different people on this podcast, but to have you say who's like a professional athlete, but then to realize 
through being a professional athlete, all these beautiful lessons of like slowing down and like just being more present and, you know, like, and feeling the things like that's, that's awesome. So yeah, man. thank you. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything we can help you promote or anything like that? Like with your life? And all that stuff. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm doing my own podcast. Here. Yeah, it's getting going. You know, okay. with with Good. my buddy John Harrison. We're, I started a 501c3 um, for young athletes, their parents and coaches, called Champion Forward. And so this podcast okay. is like a little branch of that. It's called the Healthy Champion Podcast. Okay, I love. And that. so yeah, that's gonna be coming out. And I, I, I sent you a little clip of it of yes. some of my first stuff. So I'm excited about that. So we've just finished our first episode. So that's going to be coming out in the next couple months. I'm excited about it. Okay, awesome. Well, when you have that link or anything like that, let me know and we will make sure we promote it on our podcast as well. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Jaren. Yep. Thanks so much for listening to the Lemonade Stand podcast. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to be alerted when we release new episodes. We'd also love to hear your feedback in the reviews. And if you or someone you know has an awesome Lemonade Stand story, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Thanks so much and have a great day.